<laughs> yeah, so I want to talk about going fast. Don't stand there. I want to talk about going faster. Uh, a lot of this, you know, first a little, little bit about me. One that says this, I'm really old, so that's all fine. But this is kind of the really more important thing, and that is I tend to be on the bleeding edge of technology. Uh, early implementations of new technology is kind of my specialty. Um, so one of the things I'm talking about today are things I've actually done in, in various engagements with various clients and companies I've worked for. But don't feel strange if you're not ready for this yet, because that's typical of what I tend to work on. I'm, I'm a very early adopter of technology. So if some of these things look a little strange, don't worry about it. You'll be there in four or five years at least. Um, what's probably more interesting about me is this is what I I'm really am. I'm really a change agent or disruptor. Uh, disruptor is actually a formal title now in business schools. They talk about this role in an executive team, which goes in there and basically just breaks things and rebuilds them together. Uh, it's not necessarily a guy you want to have around a lot. Um, in fact, this was actually my job description when I went to work for the Daily Mail. Uh, that was being, I was described to their CTO as the guy who's going to basically be a hand grenade in development. By the way, if you ever get this job description, you should take it because it's a lot of fun. There are no rules. Um, I go to a lot of conferences, you know, you know, anywhere from 15 to 20 a year sort of thing. I hear a lot of different topics. I talk a lot about microservices in particular uh, as one of my specialties. I'll talk about that tomorrow, in fact. But I hear a lot of other things about you know, various technologies like the cloud and NoSQL. We, had, we just had a nice lecture about NoSQL from Promote uh, right before lunch. Uh, there's obviously conferences on Docker and Cassandra and things like this. But there's also all these, you know, like us, we're here today about Agile and and I have a version of Agile called Programmer Anarchy I talk about, which is basically a, a more managerless process. Uh, Eric Meyer now has the same sort of thing. He calls it One Hacker Way. So there's a, a lot of process stuff you're seeing about in these conferences as well. And then you see the, the, basically the business guys doing the same thing. They have their own version of all this stuff, Lean Startups and MVP and things like that. And we have new roles popping up like DevOps, and we have entire conferences associated with DevOps. And I think we had a presentation uh, earlier today about DevOps as well. Full stack developer is becoming a vote topic again. I recognize there's an underlying theme to all of these things. And the reason people are investing in these things and playing with these ideas and, in, and, and moving their organization in these ways is in order to go faster. They're trying to go from that requirement to deployment just somewhat faster. Get there because their competitors are doing it as well. And the reason they're having to worry about this is the competition is coming. And it's a couple of things are going on here that are kind of interesting. First of all, from a technology perspective, there's great tech out there. No longer do you have to go out and buy an Oracle license and you know, mortgage your house, get an Oracle license, go hire yourself five or 10 or 100 programmers for several years to build yourself a system. You can buy this stuff, you can just pull the stuff from open source. You can get computing power right, off, right from an Amazon and use whatever you need and if you, as you grow and make money, use more. So those barriers are gone. There used to be very powerful barriers for big companies, they're gone. And it corresponding on the business side, the same thing is going on. It used to be you had to have a sales force, you had to get a reputation, you had to put some TV advertisements out there, uh, you know, knock on a lot of doors. Now, basically, you can sit here in Singapore, you know, bring yourself up an operation in the Dublin hub of Amazon, and attack a European market. You can go for a European market. And you can find your customers through social networks. You get something on Slashdot, you know, get something in some various other blogs. You got Google doing this for you, basically advertising for you just by doing searches against your content. All of a sudden you can find clients. And you're siphoning psych these clients off from these big companies who have no idea what's going on. So that's going on as well. And so either you're, you're aware of these things and you're reacting to these things, or you got a competitor who's gonna be doing this to you. And you're sitting there nice, blissfully ignorant as your best customers are going away. The other thing is we're actually trying to solve different problems today. Uh, the problems I used to solve back in the 70s and 80s, we were trying to get payroll to run successfully. You know, get away from the paper process and move into an automated process. Um, and this is best kind of described with this Kinefin framework from a guy named Dave Snowden. Um, if you haven't had a chance to listen to some of Dave Snowden's uh, YouTube videos, they're really worthwhile. He's Welch, he's very sarcastic. Um, uh, by the way, with a name like Dave Snowden, uh, he doesn't get any page one hits anymore. Right? He used to get some page one hits, he doesn't get them anymore. Um, doesn't it really impact his brilliance of this stuff. He basically says he can classify problems in various ways. And the idea is a simple problem is one where the cause and effect relationship is very straightforward. You know, if I step this way, if I step too far that way, the microphone will go crazy. If I step back this way, it's fine. Simple problem. 
Complicated problems are where the cause and effect relationship exists, but it's much more convoluted. This is the domain of the expert, the people who really want to try to, to understand how to do this. But he doesn't stop there. He says there are also these problems he would call complex, where the cause and effect relationship doesn't exist. Yes, if this happens today, you can probably figure out why it happened, but it doesn't help me predict the future. Your financial markets are this sort of thing. And he says it's chaotic, we have no idea what's going on. You're just struggling to figure what's going on. It turns out that, you listen to Dave talks about, most of the time you don't know what type of problem you're working on. You're in the state of what he calls disorder. And you need to figure out what type of problem it is by watching it. But he says there's unfortunately a prejudice we have as individuals. We like certain segments. We want to be in certain segments. We feel comfortable in certain segments. And no matter what the problem really is, we will drag it to our segment and try to solve it that way. If you're Donald Trump, you could just build a wall between us and Mexico, and we'll fix it. Or raise the tax of the Lord, just fix it. Of course, it's a complex problem. That's not going to fix anything. Um, complicated. That's the world of the experts. If you're one of these consultants, and you're an expert in the field, this is, this is where you make a lot of money. Because you can basically tell them what to do, and they'll put a whole team in place to do it, whatever you tell them to do. It turns out complex is doesn't solve so easily. Uh, one of the things about complex is, because there is no concept of cause and effect, there are no experts. And what happens if you're thinking there is experts, if you're still building your organization along complicated lines, which is traditionally managers and architects and designers and hierarchy of expertise, if that's your organization, you're solving a complex problem, you're going to have a lot of problems. Partly because you think you have an expert. The expert's going to say, this is how it works. And it doesn't work that way. So you fire him. You hire another expert. He says it. He fire him. He doesn't work. You don't understand, but all these people claim they're experts, they're lying. Because they have no idea what, how to solve a complex problem. So it turns out roles and managers and simple is you're supposed to train your people how to do it the best way. This is best practices. This is an area of good practices. There's more than one way to do this. And again, the expert will tell you what to do, and you leverage the expert by building yourself a team to implement his recommendations. Again, think about your typical, say, you know, model of, of uh, outsourcing for India. You know, this is the architects, the designers, the, the chief programmers, and the like. But you get over here, no experts. There's nothing really for the manager to tell you to do. Because he doesn't know either. And he can't predict your success. There's nothing really you can measure against. And so in this area, it turns out you want to work differently. And it turns out this is where, all you, make, this is where you make money these days. We've, finished, we've done the payroll applications. We've done, we can print bank statements out. We can make airline reservations. All that stuff works. That's all complicated. Well, now we're working about recommendations. Should I loan you money? What book do you want to read next? These are the sort of complex problems that we can make real money at now. And it does, these organization structures don't work. Uh, for myself, I tend to like the sort of the cowboy sort of atmosphere. Uh, I definitely love working in complex domains. I've probably worked in complex domains in the last decade. And almost all the stuff I'm talking about today is going to be around, around solving complex problems, techniques that have worked very well for solving those. So the question comes up, well, how fast can you really go? How fast can you really go? So I was working with a, you know, um, if you look at some sort of project delivery cycles, how long it takes to get code out the door, uh, I'm going to draw several of these charts because I'm old and we like to reminisce about these things. This one starts in 1980, log chart on the side here. So basically, you know, back in that time frame, I was working at IBM. Um, and, you know, three or five years to put a project out is probably typical. In fact, in that time frame, I worked on a project that had 1,000 programmers. We worked for three years and delivered on time. Don't feel sorry for us. We made a billion dollars on that software. Now it turns out, you know, when I was using a traditional waterfall process, um, and we, and I, and then moving to IBM, and I kept staying with IBM about till 1990. I, I'd have my, I started running more, more projects, um, and I got it down to like six months, sometimes five months between releases. Uh, I left IBM, started using a little more ob object-oriented techniques, still in a waterfall sort of process, um, still a little faster, but nothing spectacular. But this is a straight line on a, on a log chart, so this is good. This is good progress. And then I got into Agile, and you know, I got a little faster, but we're still talking about you know, releases every two or three months to, to actually real production customers. And then a strange thing happened. Uh, we started trying a few other things, and it just kind of just fell off the chart. This is a hockey stick on a hockey stick chart. 
This is, this is a wickedly fast. So how fast were we able to go? Um, and this data is actually several years old now from this company. This, this is working in a company in London. So we basically were shipping something new to production every three and a half minutes. Every three and a half minutes. If you're not going this fast, you can go this fast. Especially for complex problems. And it turned out we had competitive advantage by going fast. Uh, we were a company that got up to 50, 50 employees at one point. We made 50 million pounds revenue that year with 50 employees. We were printing money because we were so good at how fast we could work. Uh, and we didn't slow down. So we're going to talk more about that as well. But this is how fast you can go. If you're not going this fast, you can go that fast. All right, so what keeps us from doing this? I'm going to talk about three things that keep us from doing it, three classes of problems. First will be technology, which we're kind of comfortable with. Process, we're a little okay with that one. And organizational issues that cause us problems, and things we have to change in our organization to make this work. Uh, the first thing is, especially with big companies, you cannot be afraid of this Valley Tech. Valley Tech is what basically the CEOs, especially in the US, talk about. They want to be like Google, they want to be like Amazon, they want to be like Facebook. You know, it's like, what can I do to be like these companies? They don't like to say like the answers they hear. Because from a technology perspective, it's like, don't worry about some of these things. Use the cloud. Oh, we can't use the cloud. Oh, yes, use the cloud. Uh, specialized databases, uh, like Ramon talked about with the NoSQL databases. Use new programming languages to do more things. These are things that they, re they resist enormous resistance to. But if you're not doing these things, your competitors are, and they're going to you know, basically uh, take your customers. So you can't be afraid of that valley technology. You also want to look at hardware lead time. So this is another, another graph, you know, a historic graph. Uh, go back to only 1990 in this case. And the sort of question is, how long does it take you to get a piece of hardware to run your programs on? And watch what's going on with this chart. So back in this time frame, you know, you had to go order a machine. And it would take you like three, four, five months sometimes to get a machine in between the time you could figure it, get it in, get it established, put it on the raised floor, put all the wires together, check it out, all this other stuff. And that's kind of a lie, because it really was you had to allocate the money for it the year before and the capital equipment budget. And so really the lead time was somewhere around 12 to 18 months to get a piece of hardware in. And you better be sure you needed it, because they would yell at you, really, if you didn't use it. The nice thing is, along came virtual machines, and we were able to buy that hardware, but carve it up differently to sort of our needs as we need them. And that was some flexibility that was very powerful for us. And so the, the need to do this kind of re reduced the time to get these things to a couple of weeks sometimes. Although I was with a client only a few years ago and trying to get a virtual machine within their enterprise, and it took them three weeks to give me a virtual machine. And they broke the rules to do it. By the way, they've been acquired. And guess why? And then, of course, the cloud comes along. Amazon sort of raises the roof and basically says for us, oh, now it only takes a few minutes to get you, get you one. Once you get used to this stuff and the tools get better and better. And then you thought that was like, you can't get better than that. All of a sudden, Docker comes along. Now we're talking about seconds. I have some colleagues uh, you know, I work with in Las Vegas. Um, one of the things they're, they're doing is they're bringing up and running banking transactions in, in, in a Docker container, running one transaction, throwing it away. They don't worry about memory leaks. It's only going to last five seconds. You can't leak memory very fast in five seconds. So they're, they're completely cavalier about a lot of things about how they write software because of this sort of phenomenon. Now, if this is going on and you're not paying attention, this has impact to you and should have impact to you. The first thing is this whole need of capacity planning, this whole exercise we go through every, late every year about how much machines we need and how much money we spend and how much capital we need to allocate, can we afford it, that should go away completely. Now, there are people whose job is that's their sole job. They don't want to go away, but they should go away. They have no job anymore. And the second thing is this whole concept of ops teams to get this hardware up and running. I don't need them anymore. We're buying that as part of our services. Hence the DevOps movement. So basically, if you're not doing these things, or you're thinking about the traditional way, you're spending a lot of money and a lot of effort for things that are completely unnecessary. You get rid of that to go faster. Now, this is, this, actually, this whole chart right here is the thing that's driven the movement to microservices. The ability to go out and get a lightweight machine when I need it on demand is driven microservices. And so I draw this chart, and this is a log log chart. Just get that head around that log log chart. Um, and it says how big is, how much code there is associated with it, how many of these little code things do you have? So I start with, uh, you know, this is the one big giant application. You know, one giant application, anywhere from 100,000 to 10 million lines of code. Um, 
This was the SOA movement. So back in the, uh, you know, maybe 10, 15, 10 to 12 years ago, SOA started to raise its head. Uh, Credit Suisse was very popular in this space right at that point. And the idea was, let's take our mil several million lines of code, break it up into maybe 50,000 lines of code segments along the lines of business and do things like that. This is where the microservices is. This is kind of where I like to draw it. Uh, much, much, much smaller, much more numerous than what we're seeing in SOA. Uh, in fact, you know, I worked in a project uh, almost a decade ago now when I was working in India, there was one giant application. I will never do that again, life is too short. This is not, this is not something you want to do for your life. Uh, I, I run a workshop that talks about microservices. Uh, we basically build uh, about 15 microservices, they're less than 50 lines of code each does a really interesting, interesting application that's actually quite powerful. Uh, this was the company I worked with in London that did all these really fast things. This is where they were. And here's Netflix. You know, eight or nine hundred uh, services, about a thousand lines of Java each. And they're doing it all in Java, which is kind of curious itself, but they're doing it all in Java. Um, but yeah, this is, this is the microservices world. And these are the guys that are playing with there. And then you can start plucking Uber in here, you can plop Lyft in here, there's all, you know, Guild Group, uh, there's lots of guys you can plop in here, and they all go in the green. They're all in the green. So that's what's happening. Now when you have this sort of architecture, you have new things happening. So the next thing that's happening is the event bus is, is emerging. The operational data store, you know, if you think about your database structure, you have the operational database, and then you have your reporting database. And we have two of these because we want to organize them and index them differently. In most of the cases in California now, especially Silicon Valley, you're seeing the, the operational database is gone. It's being replaced by an event buses. So the idea that this is the data, this is your email address, you change your email address, these are both valid data points. You don't want to lose that other one. The fact you change is actually interesting. You just want to save the current state. The whole concept of the change is actually quite interesting, particularly for complex problems. And so the event bus is emerging. And when you have the event bus coming out, now you start building architectures differently. Uh, I'm a big fan of the Kafka bus. Uh, it's basically the bus behind LinkedIn. Uh, they've open sourced it. It's an Apache project. It's quite a mature Apache project at this point. Uh, you can even go to Heroku now and get yourself a, get yourself a, a Kafka bus, straight off Heroku. So it, you know, it's, moved, it's moved very mainstream. And this, this is a really dumb bus. This is not the enterprise service buses of 10 years ago. These are really dumb buses. But because they're dumb, they're very, very, very fast. So the Kafka bus can handle about a quarter of a million messages a second. And problems I tend to solve, that's a lot. That's a lot. And if that's not enough, you can put several of them together. You just you can go up if you want to. Now it turns out these guys, when they count messages, they cheat. It turns out if I write a message once and read it 10 times, that counts for 11 of the messages. You're like, whoa, dude, that sounds like it should be one. No, it's 11. So you don't want to hang 100 guys off of here because now you're back at ES, you know, enterprise service bus levels. And so what you do is you wind up hanging off a second tier of things and you hang your services off this next tier. So you try to minimize the number of these things you hang off your bus. And these are the guys that basically will take things off the bus, filter them to some degree and hand those off to the services. So when you write a service to this structure, you basically hang the service off one of these secondary tiers, and, but you always publish everything back to the top. And this is a, one of the tricks we picked up from Google, frankly. We picked up from Google, but we got some, may have gotten it from somewhere else. But the idea is, is you pub, if you're doing something interesting, publish it to the world. Don't worry about who needs it today or who may has a requirement for it. Do it anyway. Do it anyway. And you may find a need in the future. So we always publish to where everybody can get to it. We're not trying to eliminate ourselves and publish only to our little subgroup. We're not that smart. Now this sort of architecture leads to some new architectural patterns that are very powerful. So this is one we call the need pattern. It's, it's basically done because what a service does, express a need on the bus, it says, I need something. I need an advertisement I can put on the page. I need to know if loan you money. And there are other services that are sitting there that are listening for these sorts of needs and voting, basically expressing their opinions, give you an answer or suggest an answer. And you pick up these answers and put them together again. Now it looks very lightweight, but the first thing you have to do is you have to design this a little differently because it may be you get no answers. So you've got to handle that case. But if you can handle that case, then guess what? I can turn out blue service version two and put it on the same bus, and I don't have to turn off blue service number one. He can compete right there. If he gets more of the business, I can turn the other one off. So guess what? A-B testing is free. Or maybe the green service goes down. 
That's okay, the Blue Service is still suggesting answers. And again, this is a fuzzy problem. These are some of the complex problems. So yeah, I may not give you the absolute best advertisement, but I don't really know you that well anyway. I'm grouping you into groups anyway. So this turns out to be a very powerful pattern. And it makes it very easy to have variations and the system just does not go down because these services are still up, still working them, still providing value. Different architectural pattern. Very much like the impact it had when the MapReduce algorithms hit us. Different style of algorithm, solving problems in very different ways. This is one of those instances as well. Uh, just an example of how this works. You know, with this sort of architecture, you can build incremental applications. And by incremental application, I mean one that we can roll out probably in the first week and start improving it after that for, forever. So every time we do an iteration or whatever your current cycle is with the Agile space, you're pushing it to production. Why not? Maybe you have a better answer. And so you wind up, I, I have actually an animation that goes through this, but it's a car rental example. I'm, I got some space on the page and I want to put some advertising. I want to sell you more. So I want to sell you a better car. I want to give you a navigator, uh, a car seat, or so, maybe have you join my frequent renter program. So I basically actually put the system together. I got a legacy system that does this. So I put myself a message bus, some little surrogate to talk to the message bus. And every time I put a page up and need ads on, put a message on the bus saying, give me some ads. Then I write something that, you know, at the corporate level that says, yeah, here are the sort of ads I want to show you. This is a corporate level program. But every car rental location has their own surplus of vehicles. They can have their own deals on those vehicles. So they're sitting in their own little service. They're also bidding for your attention. They don't know about each other, and that's okay. They don't have to coordinate. They don't, that's okay. There's no coordination required. Makes you fast. And then I can make that a little better by adding membership information. If you remember my frequent renter club, I want to know about that. If I look at your usage pattern and find out you rent between Monday and Thursday, chances are you don't pay for your car. It's a company car. So a discount is not very interesting for you. So turn off the discount offers. Again, a little refinement, a little better application, make a little more money. By the way, we built one of these systems for one of our clients when I was in California, uh, a hotel chain. Uh, we charged them $6 million to build this. It's not that hard to build, by the way. Uh, they made $40 million additional revenue in the first six months. They were happy. We were happy. Everybody was happy. This is not a very sophisticated sort of architecture, but you built some very powerful systems around it. Databases. Um, as much as we kind of love the databases, the question is, is it's sort of the holy grail. Do you want to get one of these things or not? Um, I was, again, working with an, another hotel chain. Uh, went into their chief architect's office first day. I'm a troublemaker. I know this. So I was asking sort of the leading question. He says, well, how many operational databases do you have? He says, well, we have three. We're trying to get down to two. We're kind of embarrassed by that. So that's really interesting because the right answer is 300. It's the last conversation we ever had, uh, which was OK, because actually he was going to his vendor that afternoon and tell them about his new, ad, his new waterfall process. It's like, dude, I don't want to talk to you either. So what you really are going to move is you're moving to this event bus. It's the new sort of persistent store for the operation. It's actually the events themselves. Don't try to filter them. They're all there. And you want to put a little data. If a microservice needs a database, it should have one. Whatever type makes sense for it. And if you have multiple databases, that's perfectly OK, because the event bus is kind of the authority here. It turns out very few of these databases in my practice so far have been writable databases. Most are read and used for reference for making decisions. Uh, and only about 10% of the 10% are actually transaction oriented, which is a very powerful thing. It says just because you need transactions for your particular service doesn't mean all the rest of us stuff are stuck with, with SQL Server or Oracle. We can put in the right database for us. So you wind up going back to this example. If you look at open up this little piece of code here, it's actually running in four different containers. I got something that's publishing a little bit on the bus. I got somebody collecting the answers, sticking me in a Redis database running its own little container. And then periodically, this responder is going to pick up what the best answer is so far and send it back to the user. I would call that one service because it's sitting around one little data store. But it's four containers. Similarly, you go in the membership service, you look at what's going on there. Well, it's Let's look at what's on the bus and say, do we know this person? Just need a little key value source. Do I know this person? In which case, what, what are they? Platinum, gold, silver, what are they? And then overnight, once a night, I'm going to run an ETL process that pulls, goes to the data warehouse and pulls out their latest status, builds a new key value store. Three containers, one service. The other thing is, of course, is we have some open source. If you're afraid of open source, you're, you're a dinosaur. 
Uh, Netflix. Netflix has done some amazing stuff. Uh, you know, huge kudos off to those guys because they have really done an amazing job. Not only the service they provide, but the architecture behind it is, is stunning. So there are over 40 open source programs that came out of Netflix. They open sourced the entire stack. 40 of them. Uh, Adrian Cockroft, who was the CTO behind this, would tell you this almost more than you could possibly understand by yourself. So don't worry about trying to understand them all. There's just too many of them. But U.S. Department of Defense is using this to build their new systems. If you told me I was going to build one of these gigantic multi-million line of code systems again, this is probably where I'd start. I'd tear it up with microservices along those lines. And of course, it was actually Docker, and they have their own conferences now. And of course, everybody understands containers are here to stay. But if you're afraid of this sort of stuff, again, you're, you're, you missed the point. We also have some disruptive concurring languages, particularly functional programming languages. Uh, so uh, it's interesting enough, you look at something like Kafka, it's actually written in Scala. Not Java, not C++, it's written in Scala. And Erlang, which is, you know, Erlang is used in RabbitMQ, which is extremely solid. And so you wonder, if they're writing industrial pieces of code in these other languages, what language are you using for your code? Uh, so when, uh, just a case today, I was at the Mail Online. Uh, Mail Online is the largest online newspaper in the world. Uh, we were just rendering the pages, the entire you know, pages for all the, all the online newspaper. Uh, that was done by, used to be done by 130,000 lines of Java. Ugly piece of code. Replace that with 4,000 lines of closure. 130 down to four. There are certain problems that functional programming is a silver bullet for. If it's not in your repertoire. Uh, it's in your competitors. They'll be using it. All right, so that's kind of the talking about the technology stuff, things we're probably more comfortable with. But let's talk about the process inhibitors. First thing you gotta worry about is, first of all, what type of problem are you trying to solve? If you have an organization that's been solving complicated problems, and now they say, well, I need to decide whether I want to loan people money, and you're trying to use this organization, not gonna work. But if this is the type of problem you have to solve, I'm not sure I'd ever throw you into microservices. Because I think we've got good technology, good organizations for solving this type of problem. It just doesn't work for these. So the first thing I usually ask my clients is what type of problem are we really trying to solve here? Before I get involved with using my new techniques and processes, make sure we're solving the same type of problem. When you're solving a complex problem, we have to change our idea about what we are to build. Uh, basically, requirements were in stone tablets. To some degree, the fact we're in stone tablets is a bit my fault. Well, not personally me, but my generation. Uh, when I started out programming, I talked to customers because a big program was 2,000 lines of code. That was a monster. I can keep that in my head. That's easy. When it got to be 60,000 lines of code or bigger, we had to have a team. And the more we had teams, the more we told the customer, tell us what you want to go away. So it's own tablets. And they're used to this. The whole generation has been brought up and said, we build requirements, we tell you what to do, and we walk away. Turns out that's not the model that works in complex. Where it works in complex is how fast can you try out an idea? How fast can you try an idea out? At uh, Forward, we had the concept of experimentation drives innovation. I love that because experimentation implies we're going to try things and they will fail. My role in the company has often been when something fails and somebody starts yelling about it, especially the customer, I tell them to shut up. We're not going to slow down just because we made a mistake. We're going to just keep going fast. If you don't like my answer, you go talk to the managing director, he'll tell him to shut up. We aren't going to slow down. That's how we make the money. So this is a different way of thinking. We want to re-engage the customer and talk to them constantly, the same way I did back in 1975. We want to talk to them all the time. We want them to teach us about it. In fact, uh, if you sort of rethink our interaction with the customer, you know, we're all about stories. All the agile processes have something about stories in them. We break stories into tasks, pretty standard way of thinking about it. A colleague of mine many years ago grew this triangle and basically said, okay, but stories are part of something called features. Features are something called projects. Projects are initiatives. You can tie everything back to the business. It's quite lovely, actually. And most of the time, your agile process, this is where you interact with your customer. They set the stories, we measure stories, we, we estimate stories, we do everything on a stories basis. In practice, though, I walk into a lot of establishments, I, frankly, I walk into ones that have trouble, and you see stand-ups talking about what task did you work on? And how long did this task take? What's the task going to do tomorrow? And I see a completely unmotivated set of programmers. They just say, can't wait to go home today because it's just miserable. What we wound up doing when we worked into complex problems is we moved up and we interacted at this level with our customer. We said, customer, tell me what you're trying to solve. What's your problem? Teach me your domain. And then get out of my way. 
I'm a programmer. I do algorithms. I'm really good at figuring out clever ways to make to do things, whatever it is. I can figure that out. Get out of my way. Your job is to teach me your domain and bring me your KPIs. And that ties into this. Let's measure what really matters. I can tell you, I've been measured about everything under the sun you can imagine. I've been measured on in my career. Lines of code, how many lines of code you write today? I'm like, oh, fine, I, I can fix that metric. I can make that easy. Uh, how many classes did you do? How many function points did you finish? Uh, how many test cases did you write? I mean, all these metrics. It turned out, we, almost by accident, we started doing metrics like, how much money do we make? What's our page retention time? Uh, how many clicks do we get? And guess what? Programmers use that for their metrics. This is the game they start playing. Oh, can I make more money than you did today? And the business guy's saying, what did you guys do? We made more money today. Oh, yeah, we tried something else at work. Where would you come up with that idea? I don't know. We're algorithms. That's what we do. We're programmers. We come up with ideas. We're good at this stuff. So measure what really matters. All right. So that's the process stuff. Let's talk about the organization. Because it turns out most of your barriers in many, in many companies are going to be the organizational structure. It doesn't support the concept of complex problem solutions. First of all, we tend to over-specialize. And this goes back to the Industrial Revolution and go back to you know 1930s and stuff like that when they started doing this, this nonsense. And the theory is, of course, specialists are more productive, so we want to make sure specialists are always doing what they're good at. But of course, we completely I have undervalued, this is what just in time and therefore Agile taught us, we completely undervalued the value of being able to the communication overhead. How much time it takes to pass these things off from person to person. Now I'm working on a three-year IBM project. I got plenty of time to, to waste pass things off. If I'm working in a project where it's shipping every three and a half minutes, I don't have time to hand things off. The other thing is, of course, we have imbalance of workloads. I guess people sitting idle, so they're going to make work for themselves. So the imbalances. So we completely undervalue these things. And of course, how do we how do we get these specializations? We give people titles. So it turns out the biggest problem with with it is we give them people titles associated with their specialties. So another case study here, this guy actually is the Daily Mail as well. So I, I show up to Daily Mail, again, I'm the hand grenade here. There are 50 IT professionals in the group. I found 25 or more titles for the 50 people. And I found zero people who knew what, they were, what was going on. <laughs> zero. The poor scrum master was standing at the wall every morning trying to figure out if his project was going to work or not. It wasn't her skill set. She had no idea what was going to work. But the front end guy would say this, the back end guy would say this, and they were not talking to each other directly. Zero people. So that's the problem we wanted to fix. So we're going to fix the titles. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, so in fact, why don't we define what we said our key competencies were. So first of all, I, I like this master, German, apprentice model. You, you can use uh, Dan Norris, uh, Shu Ri. You can have four levels, five levels. It doesn't really matter. Just have one. In my world, this is competence. I can use this technology effectively. This is not competent. And a master is kind of magical creatures, and you can't really describe them. If you can describe it, it's now it's now it's now journeyman, uh, magical guys. Um, and then we identify what we thought our strategic technologies were. Uh, Ruby, I brought Ruby in. Java was our old language. I couldn't get it thrown. I threw it away if I could, but they wouldn't let me throw it away. Uh, we're a mobile platforms, uh, database expertise, both SQL and non-SQL, very important. Uh, testing, I tried to throw testing away as well. The CTO wouldn't let me do that, but. Because testing is an implicit part of the Agile process. It's not a separate skill. Uh, o design, uh, both front end and back end JavaScript. So we identified about 10 or 12 technologies, and that was as big as the list was going to get. We'll throw something away before. And we basically went through all the programmers and said, you know, basically using the masters of these skills to identify the, the criteria, are you a journeyman, apprentice, or master of these skills? Now, based upon that, we actually knew, made new titles. So the new titles for the new projects. So if you want to work on the new project, this is your title. If you don't want to work on the new project, you can keep your old title, work on the old systems. Your choice. <laughs> this is how you get away with you know, EC regu EU regulations. So we call them developer, you're competent in one of our technologies. You're a developer. You're a graduate developer if you're not competent. Now why would I hire you? You can't do Java, you can't do, you can't do CSS, you can't do anything. Why would I hire you? But it's easy to put it on the chart, so we put it on the chart. Uh, senior developer, he's the expert, he's the master. Okay, this is very traditional. This is where we did something different. We created another title called system developer. This guy was competent in five to seven technologies. Competent, not expert, competent. 
These are the guys you can hand a problem to and say, solve this problem. Here's a feature. Implement it. Oh, it's, you know, this part's going to be front end. This is part back end. This is sort of database I need. He can make those sort of decisions. And he can call upon masters when he needs some help. But he can solve problems. He can implement features. He's not one of these super specialists. And we created something called master developer. He's an expert in, in five to, to three to five technologies. Just something to be. By the way, we pay these guys the same pay scales. That's why they're the same level. Same pay scales. And you have a choice. You pick your choice. You want to go this way, you want to go this way. We don't care. Uh, we encourage people, to, if people say they want to be a system developer, we would drop them into a team. They want to be a system developer. I want to get some iOS skills. Fine. Join an iOS team. We'll invest in you to get you competent in that technology because we're going to win in the long run. So I took this to the human resources of the Daily Mail. The Daily Mail is 125 years old. It's run by Lord Rothermir, the fourth Lord Rothermir of his title. What do you think the human resources said when they saw this nonsense? Actually, they loved it. They don't want to be in the business of qualifying you whether you're a senior associate, junior programmer, and, and arguing endlessly with every programmer who walks in about what level they are. They want to get out of that game. I said, you can get out of this game. They said, fine, sign me up. Notice there's no lead, nothing called manager in this tier. They're gone. There's nothing called Java tech lead. In this, they're gone. This was our system, and it worked really well. Now, I did a startup in California after this. This was the only title we had. They were good programmers. They didn't, know, they didn't need titles to, to justify themselves. But, you know, this is the title structure we put in place. The other thing we did, and this is actually a picture from uh, my days in Bangalore, um, is you fix the furniture. This is what Kent Beck said in his first book. First thing you do on the first day is you fix your furniture. So you, we basically, at the Daily Mail, we ripped out all the cubes and put in tables. I said, you sit at the table with your team, whatever your team you're working on. In fact, we called the teams were called tables. That was the name of the team. Was, they had tables. They were called tables. Uh, the other thing we took advantage of is there's no concept of dedicated leadership. Because leadership needs to morph over time. And I got this a bit out of this book, uh, you know, Guns, Germs, and Steel. And this book is basically says villages didn't have dedicated leaders until they had at least 100 villagers. That's when you need a dedicated leader. And I'm looking at it. There's five guys and a manager. You're like, well, where's the other 95 guys this guy can, should be managing? Otherwise, you should be working in the fields with everybody else. And so basically, we got rid of the concept of having dedicated managers for teams of that size. So they were gone. And finally, it was very important basically to bring work to the team. One of the things that's very important is that every time you form a team, it takes a while for them to get used to each other. Even if they're all really smart and you have standards, it takes a while to get used to each other. And if you're really going fast, you can't afford to spend three to five to seven weeks waiting for them to gel. So you want to move into the model where you bring the work to the team. Once you have a team that works well together, bring them new work. Bring a customer in. Sit down and explain their domain. Let him start solving the problems for you. So don't play musical chairs with your team. Don't get your spreadsheets out and build yourself a new team. That's a waste of effort. You're going to kill your productivity, especially when your average project length has got to the point where it was, average project size was one person, and the average project length was four hours. That was a project. Who's going to break out a spreadsheet for this? So if you do all these things, you will actually wind up going faster. So it's not just about doing microservices or just doing Scrum or pick, one, pick your favorite topic up here. You need to do a concert of these to really accomplish what you're looking for. Because it wasn't until we had a concert of these that we have that amazing hockey stick created. That if you really get this stuff right, then you're going to go from you know, this sort of you know, really nice delivery cycle to, oh my goodness, the bottom has fell out and we're incredibly fast. This is what you're really after. If you're not here, this is where your competitors are going to be. I think that's pretty close to my time. He says yes back there. Uh, any time for questions? We have, I, I have five minutes left over? You cheated with your cards. Uh, I got a few minutes left over. I will definitely hang around as well for any questions. Anybody have questions? Everybody? Oh, yes, sir. We don't. What we do is we, we are measuring our KPIs. One of the things about event bus, you can put a KPI monitor on that easily. Whether it's clicks, you know, sales, whatever it is, you can monitor it very aggressively. If you're doing Google advertising, you know within 20 minutes whether you did a good thing or a bad thing. So we, we'll have an indication we may have done something really good, but it may not be our fault. 
it maybe actually goes really far down because another tsunami hit Japan. So you don't really know. That's the nature of the complex problems. You're not going to know. You're going to have indicators. But if something magical happens, you take it back off and it goes back down again, it's like, hey, I did this. This is me. Same thing, it goes down, you take it back off, it stays down, it's not your fault. So you have indicators of that, but they're going to be business level indicators because it's complex problems. But the KPIs are vital to making this stuff work. And the nice thing of Bus, easy to build. No other questions. Wow, this is, you're an easy audience. Is this, is this just Singapore? <laughs> yes, sir. How do you decide which direction to go? Like, if you, if, if you say your team, you know, to try out and do it, like anything, or like, there should be some direction to the team? To some direction, the team, the team is basically motivated by bringing in the features to the team. So you bring a feature to a team saying, this is what the business wants to accomplish. And this is, not, this is how much money they have to spend, and they want you to go work on this stuff. And you start working on it. And it may be you'll figure out, I can't make, make the business happy. In which case, I should stop working on it. Because I, I can't reduce your, your, I can't double your click rates. I don't have any way, I can't figure out any way to do that. Let's stop spending money on it. Let's spend money somewhere else. So to some degree, it's all about, it's about trial and error. It's about trying ideas out, how aggressively you can be in that. And the faster you try ideas out, the more money you make. Yes. Something new in production, yes. Can you give me an example of what is step one on the What is step chunk? Well, generally, most, most programmers were probably going to production twice a day themselves. So basically, they'd have some idea, some slight modification. Uh, we're using a lot of microservices that were very small, you know, 50 to 100 line of code range. Uh, they would take some existing 50 or 100 line of code thing, make a tweak to it, try a different, slightly different algorithm. Maybe we want to try a different AdWords strategy for a particular client. Uh, maybe try misspellings, for example. So we try a whole range of misspellings. We're going to see what the impact that has. So we write a service that does the misspellings, generates those, drop that into the hopper, uh, deploy that. To, you know, we, we basically post it to GitHub and we get deployed to Amazon automatically at that, base, at that point. It's just free containers. And we see if we make any money with that. Uh, nice thing about everything we worked in had fast feedback cycles from the real world. If you don't have fast feedback cycles in the real world, yet yeah, testing becomes more important. By the way, we went from notebook to production. There's no testing environment, no staging environment. No book production. Huh. Yeah, let me I'll talk about testing too. Uh, I want to get into all these things, but yes. Uh, just, just a question about the branded uh, Do you have some contest to uh, like check the graduate code Oh yes, because we, we would never let a graduate developer write code. He's pairing. In fact, you always tend to pair in this environment because pairing teaches skills. If you want to become poly-skilled, sit down with somebody who knows something you don't know. So you want to become one of these full-stack developers, put a front-end guy with a back-end guy. Front-end guy, back, front guy is going to teach the back-end guy what JavaScript's all about and CSS, and the back-end guy is going to say, here's how you build services. And at the end of the day, I have two smarter programmers. You do that every day for months, you get some monster programmers. You get full-stack developers that are absolutely stunning what they can accomplish. So I can basically bring a person on board and have them productive within the first three days, just by pairing them up with somebody. And they become basically the smart keyboard. The guy will tell him what to type, and he's at the keyboard. Uh, but he learns the system as he goes. But he, it's not a three-month training period, or I don't have to lock people into long contracts for this stuff. You pair them. Because that's how you build full-stack developers. Yes, sir? Uh, do, you, do you let team uh, learn in production, or you allow some slack for them to learn new stuff? Uh, to some degree, we always allow the slack and they never use it. This is too much fun. This is where they have the fun. If they want to try to write a new service in Haskell instead of writing it in Java, go, go fine. Write a new service in Haskell. The worst thing that happens is that Haskell and I throw it away and write Java instead. But there's very little risk when you're doing microservices of letting people try things because the, the amount of effort in 100 lines of code is not a huge investment. And so the ability to try things out in this environment is extremely aggressive. And so we don't have rules about what you can do and not do. It's basically we're trying to get the feature done. And the team itself would tend to enforce you know, productivity among, the, among themselves. If you didn't get anything done yesterday, your team's going to look at you and say, dude, why did you show up yesterday? You didn't get anything done. What are you going to do better today? The team's going to call you out on it. Not, no manager necessary. Yes, ma'am. So with the uh, deployment every um, so often, well, how long is the feedback cycle? So it's going directly into production. Um, how soon do you get that feedback that it's working or not working? In most environments we were selling into, it comes back within the first five to 15 minutes. And, and how did that work? 
Uh, basically, we had we had huge arrays of monitors in various rooms monitoring our various systems, and we actually could flip them over into different skills or whatever. But we had at least 16 in every room, um, and and basically, if you did a deployment on on maybe a different algorithm to use in Japan for for AdWords advertising, we'd watch the Japan numbers after we deployed. And if they start going down, it's like maybe it wasn't such a good idea after all. Uh, but you sort of hang around as a programmer if you did that deployment for the next 15 to 20 minutes to see if it looked like it was good or not. If all the numbers went to, went down immediately, you, just took, you walked back, backed it out. I don't. I never remember us actually ever backing anything out. We always rolled forward. We always fix it and roll it forward because we were that fast at making changes. I'm sure we did, but I, I never saw an instance of it. Uh, yes, sir. Um. I have, to, I have pairing rules. First of all, a, a, you can't pair two graduate developers together because they can't get anything done. I mean, at best, they're going to not hurt you today. That's the best you can hope for. And they don't feel good about it. Um, so my, my rule is that my, my masters and my journeymen have to out outnumber my apprentices. I, I want at least 10% of my staff to probably be those masters, about 10%. And that's a pretty high ratio. Uh, I tend to get that in my projects because I go, go find them and recruit them. Uh, but one of the things that pairing does is it creates more masters. Um, so you can't become a master unless you study under masters. Very much like PhDs. Uh, you you still get a PhD by studying under another PhD, and there's another committee of PhDs to decide you're now a PhD. Master programmers are pretty much the same way. Masters seem to know masters, and they can look at you and say, you're not a master. And they, you're not, why? Well, they can't give you the list because they're masters. But, but you can study under these guys and get it. And I think uh, you know, Dan North does a nice job when he talks about Shuha Reed, that the highest level, you can't become the highest level in that martial art unless you can prove you can teach. And so the teaching of others is a very fundamental part of this. And so I think that's the job of my master program is to make more masters. Not write code, make more masters. And I have a little sign that says it's really the end this time. You, you're sure now. It's another five minutes you scrolled away somewhere. All right. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank uh, you, Fred. Thank you for the interesting. Program.